as you can imagine, I spend a lot of time on social media debating, you know, uh, oil and gas issues, energy transition issues, and so on. And I would say that, you know, 99.9% .9 of the folks who come onto the threads uh, and make comments are, you know, they say something like, uh, well, I feel or I think or, you know, something like that. And essentially, what you think and what you feel is not important. It's what you can back up with data, with citations, what you can back up with data evidence. And that, you know, for somebody like me who spends, you know, all day, every day, uh, in, enmeshed in that world, deep in that world, that's one thing, and I get that. Uh, for the average uh, reader and viewer uh, here at Energy Media, I want to give you a really simple model for what for taking a look at the global energy transition and then coming to an informed opinion about what you think uh, the pace of that uh, transition will be. And I don't want to tell you, I'll tell you where we come uh, come down on it based on the work we've done, but you can go in without spending a lot of time and effort. You can come to your own conclusion using this model. So here we go. Um, first of all, uh, here is the, the graph of the three basic scenarios for oil and gas demand. And each one of them, uh, each uh, this one has high, middle, and low. So on the high side, uh, you have uh, scenarios like OPEC, you have the IEA's um, uh, current uh, policy scenario, which got added uh, this year, uh, added, added back actually. Uh, and so uh, take a look at this, you know, this is a, a graph for, uh, for uh, the scenarios for oil demand. And you can see that we're at about 100, 103 million barrels a day today. And OPEC sees that it's going to be, uh, or thinks it's going to be um, 120 by, by mid-century. Then you have the middle case. And this is uh, the IEA steps would be the uh, most well-known example of this. And uh, steps, yes, it agrees that there will be peak oil demand by 2030. But then instead of decline uh, sometime between 2030 and 2035, uh, it sees a plateau, kind of a bumpy plateau for out to 2050, and there'll be a, a decline from about 103 to 94, 95 million barrels a day. But that's still a lot of oil, a lot of oil demand. Uh, but that usually gets referred to as the business as usual case. And then there's the low case, which is in this case, the, the example we're using here is the IEA APS scenario. And in this one, the decline is very significant. It goes down from 103 million barrels a day down to 55 or 57. I mean, it almost drops by half. And uh, so those are the three basic scenarios. And the so what makes the, you know, uh, the different analyses, uh, you know, why the data can't be that uh, different? So how do the scenarios turn out to be different? And it's all about the assumptions. That's that's what makes, and this you know I, I regularly cite uh, Dr. Chris Bataille from Columbia University, uh, who is an energy modeler, and uh, you know he said you know every every modeler will uh, right at the beginning of the study they'll set out their assumptions, and so you can go and you can you might not be able to do the math I certainly can't check the math, uh, but I can check the assumptions and then I can compare the assumptions to the real world data and analysis that I'm seeing in front of me at any given any given time. So what is an assumption in this context? Well, for starters, let's let's take uh, since we're talking about oil, let's take the the biggest uh, portion of oil which is uh, about 45-50% for road transport. And we're not talking about just uh, light duty cars and trucks. We're talking about medium duty. We're talking about heavy duty, like uh, freight trucks, uh, class eight freight trucks. We're talking about buses and two and three wheelers, which are huge in, in China, India, and the rest of, of Asia. Uh, we're talking about rail. We're talking about all sorts of different types of, well, I guess rail is not road, road transport. Scratch that. Uh, but anyway, you know, basically road transport. And um, uh, so the question is, uh, the China has, uh, over the last 15 years, built up an electric vehicle industry. Uh, and then there, of course, there are others like Tesla. Uh, but China is clearly out in the lead. It has uh, the most manufacturing capacity in the world for EVs. It's got battery supply chains. It's got all the supply chains that you need to, to dominate in, the, in this field. And the question becomes, how fast will the global auto fleet electrify? 
So if you're OPEC, uh, you think that it will electrify very slowly because you think that these technology, you know, like an EV is, is considerably more expensive than an internal combustion car, an ICE car. And, and so that's not going to come down anytime soon. And governments are tired of, of uh, paying subsidies. Uh, and so they're going to end those or, or at the very least reduce them. And so the assumption is that electric vehicle adoption will uh, will be relatively slow and therefore that's that's why you see the uh, OPEC uh, uh, you know their their scenario uh, shows significant growth out to 2050 and I should point out that that's the scenario that people like Alberta Premier Danielle Smith and the Alberta oil CEOs and even you know Prime Minister Mark Carney and his energy minister Tim Hutchins they all take their guidance from the high scenarios and so now you can understand why there was a a pipeline mou and big you know expansion plans for the alberta oil sands and so on is because they think that the high scenario is the most likely by 2050 that means big growth in oil and that means opportunity and investment for canada that's where they're coming from now the middle case is I see this in a, in a lot of the other sort of, you know, the like S&P Global, which does a lot of work for oil and gas companies. So you're not going to expect them to be really, uh, you know, oriented towards the low case. But even S&P Global will acknowledges that peak demand is coming at 2030. But then um, I interviewed their uh, head of oil and he said, look, the system's really sticky. There's, you know, we've got hundreds of billions, trillions invested in all this infrastructure. It's not going away. People are not going to get rid of their cars right away. You know, we can't uh, really electrify long haul trucks uh, because freight takes up a, a big part of the uh, demand. Uh, so it, the system is sticky. And that means that's why we think it's going to more or less plateau. So you see a, a reduction from 103 million barrels a day down to 94. It's a little, it's a reduction, but but not a big a, a big reduction. And uh, and so uh, they think that the the technology will be adopted quicker than OPEC does, but not all that quick. And so you get kind of a middle of the road uh, scenario, business as usual uh, scenario, because then there's all sorts of other assumptions about uh, demographic, you know, how much is the population going to grow and, and how much uh, in the emerging economies like uh, India and Southeast Asia and places, you know, how much, uh, what will their uh, demand for, uh, for cars and trucks be? Yeah, yeah. those are all assumptions uh, that get built into the, into the model. So now we come to the low case, the IEA APS. And if you follow us at all, you know that this is the one we think best fits the data. So what we've done and what we do, we do all on a regular basis is we go and we look at a broader range of the assumptions that I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment here. Uh, and, and then we compare it uh, to, the, uh, to the actual data. How fast is uh, transportation electrifying? Uh, are there other uses for oil? Well, of course there are. there are petrochemicals and there's aviation, there's, there's marine shipping, you know, how fast are they expected to grow and are they growing that fast and so on. So when you look at all of those assumptions, we think that the, a the APS scenario is the most likely. Now, to make this really simple, you know, I've given you three, sorry, three <laughs> simple scenarios, but I want to give you one simple assumption, and that is China. China has emerged as the world's first electrostate. So 15, 20 years ago, it, uh, it was investing heavily in uh, batteries and then in solar panel and wind uh, manufacturing and wind turbine manufacturing and uh, heat pumps and all of these clean, elect uh, clean energy technologies and a lot more behind that we don't talk about, you know, like uh, power grid equipment and so on. Uh, China has, has not only invested heavily, they've scaled it up. And they've scaled it up so high that they have more the uh, the capacity to manufacture a lot more of this technology than they do, and that's why the West complains about overcapacity and dumping in uh, in foreign markets. You know, selling these car uh, cars and trucks and whatever uh, below cost, that kind of thing. The Chinese have a very different way of looking at it. They say this is not overcapacity. This is we're building in advance of demand because they think that given that uh, the uh, support that they're providing in the global south and in Europe, 
uh, and their ability to provide vehicles that are electric vehicles that are below the purchase price of ICE vehicles, and then come along with all the other benefits like acceleration and quiet and, and, and so on, uh, they think that the spread is going to be very, very rapid. And now they have the industrial capacity, the manufacturing capacity to, to meet that demand. So all in all, you could, if you watch China, watch what China does internally, because of course, uh, they're the world's largest uh, Uh, auto market, I think it was 22, 23 uh, million uh, units that they, they move a year. Uh, and um, now they are up, um, I think it was talk of them getting to 60% of uh, new sales. Uh, what, well, the vehicles would have a plug. I don't think it's going to get that high. We'll probably see around 55, maybe to 58 at the most. That's a lot. And the betting is that by 2030, it will be up around 85 or 90 percent. So clearly, China is uh, trying to electrify its domestic global auto fleet, and then it is pushing into other other markets. And uh, the amount of you know, uh, four years ago they exported uh, one million vehicles. Now they're exporting six million vehicles. I mean, China has turned into a major auto exporter. Uh, and a lot of those uh, vehicles, not all, of them, but a lot of them are, are EVs, but they're also building auto plants. You know, BYD, for instance, is building in Turkey, it's building in Brazil, it's building all over the place. And there's lots of other uh, Chinese EV com companies that are doing the same. But they're not even, it's not even that. They're also licensing their technology. So they'll work or they'll joint venture or they'll license technology to like an Indian company. And then that Indian company will go ahead and produce vehicles or parts of vehicles that, uh, you know, based on that, uh, on their license and sell them. And that'll be part of, so China plays a role in that, even though it's, it's domestically owned manufacturing in the, in whatever country it's in. So we think if you look at these three scenarios for oil demand, and then you take you follow China on a regular basis, and you th and you look at what they're doing in terms of electrifying transportation. Bloomberg NEF. If uh, if you look at n nothing else, uh, look at uh, Colin McCarricker, Canadian good Canadian boy, uh, who heads up their clean uh, transportation division. Excellent, excellent methodology and data, and they do really, really top work. So if you watch Bloomberg NEF, you'll get a good sense of where, you know, EV sales are going and batter, where batteries are going and so on. And then you can, you can compare uh, that data to the assumptions behind the, uh, uh, behind the three scenarios. And basically it is, is China going faster than expected, slower than expected, about as, as expected? And that'll either give you the high, the low, or the, the middle case. It's, it's rough and ready, I get that, uh, but at least that way, then when you come to a thread or you, you're in a, you know, debating around the Thanksgiving uh, dinner table, you can say, well, look, you know, here's my, my, I'm bringing receipts for my, for my argument. And that will be very, you'll, you'll score all kinds of points and, and you'll, your relatives will think you're smart. Uh, so if you want more detail, you know, follow us, subscribe. Uh, uh, I would encourage you to subscribe to our Substack um, because uh, Thoughtful Energy Journalism, because we're publishing a lot more there, uh, one essay a day, and a lot of it has to do with this particular topic. We delve in more detail. Uh, so um, keep it coming and we will do our very best to stay on top of the data and tell you whether or not we still think the APS scenario is the most likely outcome uh, for, uh, for oil demand.